The story of Taffy 3 is a well-known and well-regarded one. Many an author or video maker has tread these grounds, covering the dramatic stand of the small ships against overwhelming odds. Most anyone with even a passing interest in naval history has heard this story. Heard of Johnston's constant charges and blasting away at anything that moved. Of Samuel B. Roberts, the destroyer escort that fought like a battleship. Maybe even of Gambier Bay, the unlucky escort carrier. Yet the other destroyers and destroyer escorts typically pass by without so much as a how do you do. USS Heerman, for example, survived the engagement and the war itself. She, in fact, proved to be surprisingly long-lived. But she also isn't the topic of this video, even if she will get her own relatively soonish. No, the topic of this video isn't Heerman or Johnston or Sammy B. The topic of this video is the other destroyer that sunk fighting impossible odds. USS Hull, a ship lucky to get more than a passing mention when talking about the battle off Samar. Which is a shame, since she may not have been as lucky or battle-hungry as her sister, but she still has a story to tell all her own. Maybe someday we'll even find her wreck like that of Johnston. Though considering how deep Johnston and Sammy B are, that probably won't happen anytime soon. And if I've got any trademark, it's wanting to cover the ships that don't normally get covered. Of course, the story of the whole begins the same as any ship. She was laid down on June 4th, 1942, launched on December 19th, and finally commissioned on July 29th of the next year. Pretty standard for a Fletcher-class destroyer, to be honest. Relatively fast construction and commissioning, as the American shipyard system went burnt on printing out all manner of ships, but especially Fletcher-class destroyers. What is less standard is that she got to see potential combat even before finishing her shakedown cruise. In August 1943, during her typical post-commissioning pre-combat service shakedown training, Hull happened to be nearby when a coastal patrol spotted the conning tower of a submarine attempting to surface near San Diego. No friendly submarines were nearby at the time, so various ships got called in to try and track down the contact and deal with it. Hull, training and working up nearby, would be one of them. Over the course of the day on August 26th, she would make several depth charge runs on the contact, expending no fewer than 52 depth charges trying to sink the mystery submarine. There was never any evidence of anyone succeeding, though, meaning that there was either never a submarine there, and it's not uncommon during the stresses of wartime, even on the home front, to make misidentifications, or the submarine got away. Or, I grant you, it sank somewhere where no one ever saw any evidence of the sinking. Japanese records being what they are, we'll probably never know. Regardless, Hull would wrap up the rest of her training having gotten a head start on anti-submarine warfare whereupon she was sent out to do the typical war late war Fletcher things, escorting carriers. Yeah, not the most exciting or glamorous of duties in late 43 and early 44, but still a common thing to do. In Hull's case, she would escort the small escort carriers towards the Gilbert Island campaign, specifically helping with shore bombardment and the like at Macon. This should have been fairly boring duty, but the Japanese decided they were going to seek a submarine in. The submarine... I-175, approached the American fleet on November 22nd, and in spite of Hull's previous adventure off San Diego, she failed, along with the USS Gridley, to find the contact. I-175 would, as a result, sink the escort carrier Liscombe on the morning of the 24th. This sinking would see the carrier's bomb magazine detonate, blowing her stern off and sinking her in less than 30 minutes. That killed nearly 650 men, including the Admiral in charge of Task Group 52.3. While Hull would not be involved in the subsequent hunt of I-175, the submarine would end up escaping, having made her own mark in history. Hull's own fortunes wouldn't take a turn for the embarrassing. While patrolling the entrance to Tarawa's lagoon, Hull had the misfortune to run herself hard ashore on an uncharted reef. So hard, in fact, that her bow was high and dry, and she was stuck up to her forwardmost 40mm mounts. During the various attempts to get her off of that reef, the tow lines broke on December 2nd, and Hull's attempts at getting herself off in high tide only succeeded in moving her about 15 feet. It would take two ships helping her to get her off that reef later in the day. Luckily for her, the Japanese didn't take the opportunity to launch any air raids. 
and even more fortunately, the damage was limited to wrecking her sonar gear and damaging her propellers. She couldn't do much more than 20 knots without intense vibrations, but after divers patched that up a bit, she was fit to play escort duty pack to Pearl, where more proper repairs could be completed. Following those repairs and further training, Hull would return to escort duty for the campaign in the Marshall Islands. How exciting! But no, really, like I said, this is what a destroyer does in late 1943. And a couple glaring exceptions aside, it's all Hull would do. One of those exceptions, before the big one of course, would come in March of 1944, specifically March 27th. On the afternoon of that day, Hull would come across a canoe carrying Japanese Special Naval Landing Force troops. Say that five times in a row. This is mid-1944, though, when the Japanese penchant for not surrendering is well known. And, unfortunately, when American troops would often not give them the option. That does not make what followed right, but it is about what one could unfortunately expect. Hull's crew hose down the canoe with their 40mm guns and smaller machine guns. There's some argument on if the Japanese actually ever fired on them, but the most likely, at least from Hornfisher, who can generally be trusted on this kind of subject, is that the Japanese commander fired on his own men to prevent surrenders, and Hull's crew just finished the job, as it were. Regardless, not a single man on that canoe would live. To this bloodshed, Hull returned to her usual duties. She spent, perhaps, a bit more time on anti-submarine warfare than most destroyers, which is fitting for how her career started. But it was all still pretty routine, still the usual roles for any destroyer in the fleet. Nothing particularly awe-inspiring or special, just the usual. Until that one day off the coast of Samar Island. The battle off Samar will be covered in its own video, naturally, at some point in the future. As will the individual actions of each ship and their own overviews. This video will focus almost exclusively upon Hull's actions in the battle, with any references to other ships entirely down to if they cross paths with her. So, October 25th, 1944. A pretty normal day with calm weather that must have seemed like any other day in the Philippine campaign. It came as a complete shock then, when the morning saw the imposing form of Japanese heavy warships bearing down upon the light ships of Task Unit 77.4.3. Taffy 3, as has been said in multiple places and formats, was by no means equipped to fight a formation led by Yamato herself. The escort carriers and their lightly equipped planes were guarded by only three destroyers, Hull, Heerman, and Johnston, and four even smaller destroyer escorts, including the plucky Samuel B. Roberts. Hull, as the ship leading the escorts, would receive orders to charge the Japanese and slow them down however possible as the carriers beat a hasty retreat. Shell splashes of multiple colors fell down around the ship, each color intended to mark the ship firing it for the gunners shooting the shells. It created a surreal effect as the destroyers and destroyer escorts formed up on their brave charge into the teeth of Admiral Corita's center force. Johnston, as is well known, charged first. Hull, under Commodore William Thomas, her original commanding officer, sent out orders to form up on Hull for a proper unified attack. Heerman, on the other side of the formation, had to charge through the carriers and very nearly rammed her sister trying to get into position. She pulled in behind Hull, with Roberts trailing behind Heerman. Aboard Hull, Thomas and her commanding officer, Commander Leon Kentberger, chose to charge their destroyer right down the Japanese formation to cause the most chaos possible. They sailed Hull towards both the cruisers and battleships, fully intending to fight both at once. This would not come without a cost. While Kent Berger's ship handling proved able at avoiding hits, it could not and would not last forever. Hull would take hits to her bridge and Mark 37 fire control director, completely destroying her voice radio and her fire control radar, in addition to killing several men and wounding both of the commanding officers. Not that it stopped her. Just like Johnston, Hull continued right on regardless of the damage. After launching half of her torpedoes at the nearest battleship, Congo, the destroyer turned away. While her torpedoes didn't hit, they did take Congo out of the battle for some time, but by getting so close, 9,000 yards-ish, 
to launch them, Hole would take more hits on her attempt to pull away. These would, among other things, wreck her port engine and lock her steering, forcing her back towards the Japanese until men could get down into her hull and start manually steering her. These hits also wrecked her number three gun, soon enough followed by both of her aft guns being disabled. A shell quite literally blew off part of her number four gun's barrel, and another jammed the number five gun in place. Hull, now steering by hand cranking her rudder and with only her four or two guns available, both of which firing without proper radar, reduced to using her search radar, which is not at all designed for this, or a director, continued to fight back. The two guns fired at anything they could bear upon as the ship continued to attempt to pull away. With Japanese ships closing in, there were no shortage of things to shoot at. Kensberger fired the remaining five torpedoes at a Japanese cruiser, or so he thought, though tracks of the battle indicate he probably fired at Yamato instead. Certainly, this is the point where Kurita pulled away, running from torpedoes directed at his flagship. It is generally accepted that Hull's commander, in the chaos of battle, simply mistook what he was firing at. Considering the shape his ship was in, that's understandable. At any rate, during this process, Hull's guns continued to blaze away. There's even some level of evidence that she landed a hit on Yamato, which really says everything about how chaotic this battle was. Unfortunately, with only one working engine and hand steering the rudder, Hull was never going to escape. She was, at this point, around 7,000 yards from the nearest Japanese ships, which is functionally point-blank range, and in spite of heroic efforts to track splashes and dodge attacks, Hull continued to take hits. Armor-piercing shells slammed through her thin hull, anti-personnel shells turned her decks into a bloody mess, and eventually, an 8-inch shell from one of the cruisers disabled her remaining engine. Now dead in the water and listing badly, Hull was helpless in the face of the Japanese. They continued to pound her into a flaming wreck as they sailed past for better targets, and Hull continued to defiantly fire back with her remaining two guns, even after a shell ignited a fire in her forward magazine. It could, and never would, last forever. By 8.40, Hull was listing to the point that the order to abandon ship went out. After bodily dragging the gunners from their mounts, the crew jumped into the water. Their ship, no longer resembling a Fletcher-class destroyer at this point, finally went under. The men in the water would be treated to the only up-close-and-personal glimpse of Yamato that any American would ever receive, as the Japanese sailed past and left them there. Ultimately, their own navy would leave them there, too. It would take nearly two days for whole survivors to be plucked from the water, at which point only 86 were left alive. In the end, it is true enough that Hull doesn't have Johnston's dogged determination to keep charging back into the fray, or Sammy B's fame for her small size and outsized impact on the battle. But Hull, she did her duty. She fought hard and well, even potentially landing a hit on Yamato herself. That's something to be remembered. Or, to quote her commander, Fully cognizant of the inevitable result of engaging such vastly superior forces, these men performed their assigned duties coolly and efficiently until their ship was shot out from under them. Kent Berger did, for those wondering, survive, unlike Captain Evans over on Johnston. For those who stuck to the end, if you'd like to help support the channel, I do have a Patreon. Right now, admittedly focused more on my writing than videos, but it is there. There's even a simple $2 general support option if you don't particularly care about previews and the like. So, yeah, if you want to help support the channel, consider dropping a couple dollars there. It really does help with books, believe me, those get expensive quick. There will be a link in the video description and the pinned post. If you can't, well, thanks for sticking around to the end of the video anyway. I appreciate my viewers, after all. Remember to like and subscribe, since that helps too, and I'll see you all in the next one.